Hi, my name's Cliff, and uh, I'm here to tell you how to do horrible things with the JVM. So, um, so hooning, right? A, a hoon mobile. That this is this is what it, this is what hooning means to travel at speed in a confined area. Basically, just be a jerk um, and do horrible things with your car. You know, like more than just putting a wing on it. You know, putting putting a turbo in in, in a minivan, doing other terrible things. It's kind of what I like to do. Um, <laughs> to tell you a little bit about me, um, I'm CTO of a company called Boundary. Uh, we do uh, monitoring, so. Go to my one product pitch. Go to free.boundary.com to uh, get 10 free servers under monitoring, uh, one second level data. It's cool stuff. Um, all right, product pitch over. So um, we process a lot of data, and uh, I've you know had to bend over backwards to make a lot of this stuff work. Uh, so <clears throat> some some of the things I've learned. So everyone everyone has uh, seen this quote before, right? Premature optimization is the root of all evil. Newth said it. It must be right. <laughs> you know. Um, so the thing about this, and, and you know, the, the thing about this, this quote is that I think that this gets used as like kind of a bludgeon a lot to, um, to, to justify bad and slow software, uh, essentially. So I, I think people just sort of trot this, trot this thing out to say, oh, you know, it's good enough and blah, blah, blah. And, and then, you know, when you're six months down the road and you've painted yourself into a corner, it doesn't, you know. Anyway, the, the, um, the interesting thing is, is that how many people have actually read the paper this came from? Yeah? Okay, cool. Uh, I would recommend everyone go and read it. You can find it online. It's been scanned into a PDF. Um, and it's, it's actually, it's a really interesting argument because, like, if you, if you look at it contextually, uh, back in 1974 when, when they were talking about this, uh, Newth was really talking about go-to versus structured programming. And by structured programming, I mean, you know, if statements and uh, 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 loop, looping constructs, right? Like, like while loops and for loops and you know, um, you know, recursion and, and all the things that we actually take for granted as, as working and being fast, right? Um, but at, in, in, their, in their time, the, the big debate, um, the big debate was uh, between, you know, using go-tos and, and using, um, uh, between using go-tos to, to tune the code as tightly as possible uh, versus, you know, the trade-off you get with, uh, with, with, you know, using stru more structured uh, programming but, but getting a much slower program. And in, in their day, the trade-off really was between the readability of the code that you produce um, and the speed. And there was a direct trade there. But, but what Newth was saying was like, hey, look, uh, you know, we should be writing, you, you, like his idea was that, that the programs that you write are going to have a life cycle you know, far beyond the, the, the tooling underneath of them, right? And so the idea there is that you're gonna write something, it's gonna be running somewhere for, for quite some time, and we should be re writing our programs for maintainability and then trust the, the, the tooling layer beneath to get better over time. So let's, let's improve the compilers, let's improve the, uh, let's improve the, the, you know, the, the pieces underneath so that they can make this fast by default um, as long as we have well-structured programs. Um, which is actually, you know, it, when people use that quote, they're not talking about that at all. Um, so, and I think we're kind of at a similar place now, but in a different way, right? Because computers are very different than they were, they're very different today than they were back then. Um, and and uh, so I, you know, I, I, would, I would posit that the limiting factor for most computation is actually not the speed at which you can uh, execute an individual instruction. Um, so, uh, you know, the, 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 there's many different, there, there's many other bottlenecks that, that are, that are uh, much worse than, than that for, for performance. Um, and, and the other thing is that the v, is that VMs and well we have VMs now they didn't even have them in 1974 but like we, you know the VMs and compilers we have they're they're a lot more advanced um, so it's it's a really a different landscape and I just wish people would stop using that quote um, and and I think that you know what what we have today with a little bit of massaging and specifically the JVM in this talk uh, you know it, it allows you to be able to to write uh, readable yet fast code. Um, so who, who here has heard, and I, I think, yeah, I, I, th I think um, uh, Martin Thompson's here too, or not in the room, but at the, at the conference. Um, so uh, very cool. Uh, mechanical sympathy is really, uh, is, is a great uh, turn of words. The, the idea being that you, know, you write software that, that, uh, that is in sync with the machine. Um, and you know, this is sort of my techniques for doing it uh, that I kind of came up with um, through a lot of performance tuning and yeah.
Anyway, memory latency. So memory latency is, uh, I think, the, the big killer. Uh, now, obviously, these numbers are, are kind of nonsense, and you know, uh, they're going to be different depending upon what kind of hardware you're on. But as you know, sort of rules of thumb, or like general, um, you know, as far as as, uh, as as like sort of a general um, uh, order of magnitude, this this works pretty well, right? And so, all the way at the top we have registers, and then all the way down at the bottom, well, no one's using tape backup anymore, I think. But um, you know, the the uh, you know you have network access down there, and that can take however long it's going to take. And I like, to like, I like to put this into relative terms um, to really give you a sense of the numbers because you know, when you look at those numbers, it's, it's, it's hard to reason about them, right? So I like to, to think in, like, in relative terms, like let's say, we, let's say we were equating one nanosecond to one mile. Um, and we're, we're, we, you know, the, the analogy would be uh, travel distance, right? So registers, that's like about a mile, about a mile's walk. Um, so you, know, you, you could walk that. Uh, pretty, pretty, pretty easy to, to get to. An L1 cache is like a nice bike ride. So you know you're you're going. Um, <clears throat> you know it's a nice bike ride. So uh, you know it'll take you about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Uh, the L2 cache is like a suburban commute. You know you're going 40 miles out of the city center every day, coming back. Your life's kind of hellish. Uh, main memory. That's a day trip. You don't want to be doing this all the time, but uh, every once in a while, it's, it's like you know going from San Francisco down to Santa Cruz. So it's it's going to take you the whole day. Uh, and then going to the hard drive is, actually, is literally going to Mars. Um, so that's, yeah. I mean, it depends on the orbital mechanics uh, at the point in time, you know. But you're, you're talking about, you know, uh, like 500 million miles or I don't know, whatever it is. But, um, and then, of course, the network, who knows, right? It could be close. It could be far away. It could never show up. Uh, it's just whatever. You know, interstellar travel, generation ship. So goodbye, and we'll see you someday, maybe. And, You'll be a different species. Anyway, <laughs> uh, locality of reference is um, so. So, so how, how do we how do we deal with how do we deal with the, the, these caching primitives? How do we deal with this hierarchy of memory because it's never going to go away? Um, and the way that most of these things are built is to take advantage of locality of reference. And um, the what this means is is that it's the principle that if you're accessing thing one, you're probably going to want to talk. You're, you're probably going to want to access. Thing, uh, uh, the, the, the thing right next to it as well. Um, so you know, the, 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 what the caches will do is a lot of times they'll prefetch things and uh, the, they'll get things in big blocks. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting over being sick. <coughs> they'll get things in big blocks. Uh, and and you know, if you're accessing things that are close together, uh, it's more than likely that they'll be in a, higher, that they'll be in a uh, uh, much lower latency cache. So that makes your code faster. And so the J, the the back to the JVM, uh, the JVM memory model makes this terrible. Um, doesn't work right. So, uh, in the, uh, on the JVM, you basically have uh, you have three regions of memory that you you get to deal with. Um, there's the stack, and the stack gets used uh, for local primitives, um, <clears throat> local object references. So like everything in the JVM is a pointer. So uh, you know all the all the pointers you have to the objects that are allocated out in the heap, you you can you can have them on the stack. Uh, for the heap, um, that's basically any kind of object allocation. So, so anything that anything that uh, gets gets uh, instantiated via the new keyword goes onto the heap. And then you have the uh, you know the the weird direct stuff that you know crazy people like me are always talking about, which is you know you get via direct byte buffer, which is kind of slow, uh, or the uh, or you can just use unsafe um, as is, and we'll we'll get into that in a bit. Um, and, and, and so of these, you know, the heap uh, is where the GC primarily operates. Um, the stack is only for primitives, so you don't really get too much of a say in, in what goes on the stack. Um, and then the direct, you have to manage yourself. <clears throat> uh, and so, so what am I talking about with, with primitives here? So, so the JVM has this idea of the primitives versus objects, right? And the primitives, um, and, and, and the primitives are, are mainly just numbers, right? So you get, uh, you know, all the different widths of numbers. You don't get an unsigned type because you know, a Gosling doesn't love you, and um, yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. So, so it's just mainly numbers, and, and for the, the purpose of, of the talk, we're just going to stick to numbers. But um, the problem with objects is that you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of overhead with objects. So you have a 12-byte header on the 32-bit JVM. Uh, the header gets out to 16 bytes on the 64-bit JVM, depending upon whether compressed pointers are on. Um, yeah, and so the, the compressed pointers will save memory on your 64-bit JVM as long as your heap is smaller than 32 gigs, which 
I hope it is, because otherwise, well, I mean, if it isn't, you should be using the Azul stuff anyways. But anyway, um, the, and, and the, 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 the fields get reordered uh, and packed. To, so so part, of the, part of the memory model spec for the JVM says that you, you can't really, uh, you're not supposed to know where stuff ends up in memory. So you can't just you know, M map a thing and, and uh, you know, trust that it's going to end up in the right place. Um, the JVM does not let you do that, which is why most serialization on the, on the JVM sucks. Uh, and so Java gives you this false trade, right? So it gives you this, uh, this, this trade-off because of the, 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 the constraints of the memory model. It gives you this, this, this trade-off with your programming where, you know, if you want to have generic good, you know, what we've all been told is good programming practices, right? And you have generic algorithms. Uh, you know, you're going to write your list structure once and it should be, you know, uh, you should be able to use it for any type, right? Because it shouldn't care what type goes in it. And that's true, but uh, it comes with the overhead of wrapping all the primitives up. And um, you end up pointer chasing, and it's, you know, the, the overhead is just atrocious. So you're, you're, you're forced to choose. Um, you're forced to choose between flexible and slow or brittle and fast. Um, and uh, it's actually a very different trade off than what Nuth was talking about. Um, you know, the, the, because the inflexible code is actually perfectly readable, you're just going to have, you know, you're just going to have more of it, right? Uh, and it's, but it, but the, the, the problem isn't, the problem isn't that, that it's not readable. The problem is, is that um, it's, too, it's too specific, right? And so you have to, uh, to, to, to actually make changes and to move fast, you, um, you know, you, you end up having to do a lot more work. But the nice thing is, is that there's tools to fix this. And, and so I've, I've found a lot of things, uh, I've found a lot of things that can, that can help with this. And uh, we're going to go through them real quick. So HPPC. Um, I love HPPC. So it's, a, uh, so it's this really cool collections library. Uh, it's on GitHub. It came out of, uh, I think it's Abandonware, because I haven't seen a commit in the repo for a while. So kind of, eh. But it's, um, it works really well. Uh, so HPPC, what, what it does is, basically, it, it's a whole set of collections and data structures um, that have analogs to um, that have analogs to the um, <coughs> to, to the JUC collections, uh, but it breaks API compatibility, which is great because the API for the for the Java Util collections uh, has um, you know it, it automatically wraps things. So HPPC has all unwrapped accessors. Uh, it'll it, it, it'll actually give you access to the underlying you know array, like the actual literal primitive array, if you want, um, and it's really cool. Uh, it uses code, uh, so, so it's, it's like a, sort of like a, a hack together uh, C++ template, right? So the, the, the way the library works is, is that there's, it, it uses generics, it looks like generics in the code, um, but it goes through a, a post-compiling step where it generates, you know, the cross product of, you know, you, you know like int to long, and, and it, it generates a cross product of all the primitives. Um, so the jar ends up being gigantic, but, uh, you know, you, most jars are gigantic by the time they get into production, so yeah. It's always a trade-off, right? Uh, but yeah, so HPPC, it's really cool. Um, I've used it to great effect, you know, basically dropping it in and getting automatic speed-ups is awesome. And so here's another thing. This is a thing that I, that I wrote. Um, it's called Fast Tuple. Um, so we're, we're going to get into it in a, uh, in a few minutes here. So, uh, so, so, you know, Java. So Java is, a, is, a, is a, a statically typed language, but the JVM is extremely dynamic. And it's this weird sort of dichotomy where the, all, there's all this dynamic stuff under the hood that uh, is kind of hidden from you, um, unless you know the escape hatches to get to. Uh, so, because it has hot code loading. So you can load, you can load new code at runtime. Um, and the cool thing is, is that what FastTuple does is uh, it has a code generator. It, it compiles uh, schemas into Java code via a project called Janino. Um, and using that code generation, essentially what it does is you can delay defining your static types until runtime. So essentially, you know, if, if you think about static typing as saying, you know, having to predefine your schema or, you know, your, the layout of things, um, you, you know, at, at, the, at the time that you write it, uh, what's, what this is doing is it, it allows you to, uh, allows you to delay, um, it allows you to delay that, um, that declaration until you have sufficient information to, to be able to do that. So, so if you think about an analytic system where you, know, you might want to accept a new data type, instead of having to make code changes, just to find a new schema, and that can all be done at runtime. Um, and I'll show what that looks like in uh, just a moment. 
um, yeah, and so what it does is it, it generates contiguous, uh, contiguous uh, arrays of uh, tuples, and so you can store many thousands of, uh, of heterogeneous tuples inside the JVM with, without, um, you know, without using too much memory. And um, I'll show you how it does that in just a minute. So this is what it looks like. Uh, so can everyone read this? Okay. Uh, so so um, you, you define your schema, you give the field names, you can give them types. Uh, you can tell whether it's you can tell it whether to, to allocate on the heap. You can tell it to allocate direct so into direct memory, um, and then from the uh, from the schema you can you can generate a new tuple. You can generate an array of tuples, uh, and it even has a uh, even has a, an expression language too. So if you want to do operations on these, you the expression language will get compiled down into Java bytecode and. Suddenly, now that, that bytecode is, is now available, for op, available to Hotspot for optimization. So the, the, the cool thing is, is that you, you, know, you, can, you can basically write an entire analytics pipeline with this, uh, have it all be generic, and actually accept you know, random expressions from, uh, you can have it accept random expressions from your users to do analytics, uh, and they'll all get compiled down in the bytecode, and so you don't have to make that trade-off of, you know, we're doing more dynamic stuff, but it's gonna be slow doesn't have to be that way. Um, so I, I don't know, I think it's cool. Um, so here's the, some results from the last benchmarks I ran. Uh, now obviously most benchmarks are lies, this is probably a lie as well. Um, so you know, take it with a grain of salt, but it's pretty fast. Um, so uh, essentially um, for, for, accessing, for, accessing individual, uh, for accessing individual fields, you're looking at a couple of nanoseconds. Um, you know, on heap is, is actually a lot faster. Um, because when you look at the assembly that gets generated, it does, there's, it does a little bit less stuff. Um, but um, the, 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 big, the big weird one here, though, is, is when, when you actually do the allocation onto the direct, uh, on, onto the, um, yeah, so, so fun fact, when you do direct memory allocation um, using unsafe, uh, it's actually a JNI call. So unsafe.allocate memory goes through JNI, which is expensive and slow. Anywho. Uh, let's do a demo. So we're going to look at HPPC real quick. And uh, yeah, this is really, really, hang on, I'll, I'll, I'll embiggen this. Yeah, that's <laughs> not going to work. There we go. OK. So OK, perfect. Um, so this one's the fast tuple. OK, HPPC, here we go. So can everyone, can everyone see what's going on in here? So essentially, uh, so we're using the HPP, so we're using uh, the HPPC hash map. So this is the um, so this is an open hash map that maps integers to longs. Um, so we're just so we're just you know allocating it with uh, the size n, where we're saying n is a million, and then this this loop right here, we're just putting we're just putting the numbers in here. Uh, essentially, we we want to make sure that we don't trigger a reallocation, so we're putting it below the load factor. Um, so that's just just to explain what's going on here. So nothing up my sleeve. Um, and then memory measure is a, a library that uh, uses a, the, the Java agent API to actually measure how many bytes allocations are taking. Uh, and so this is, and then this is basically the same code down here, but just using uh, Java's regular hash map. So um, yeah, and, and that's exactly what this does. So let's run it, see what happens. And it did stuff, yep, there we go, yeah. And so we can see right here with HPPC, um, the, those you know that hash map of a little less than a million things ends up taking you know somewhere about 27 million bytes. Uh, with but with the Java util hash map, it's about 62 million bytes. So you can see like the the just the overhead of doing primitive operations in, with the regular Java stuff is not great. Um, so we have this one here. So same same I. Uh, yeah, so same, same idea, right? So, uh, <clears throat> uh, so this is, this is uh, so this is just gonna show you like, you know, the, the difference between, you know, a primitive array and a, uh, difference between a primitive array and, and uh, you know, a, a wrapped array. So, so, you know, this is, this is just a stripped down version of the last one, but again, you're gonna see how much stuff gets wasted. Um, and you know you're you're, talk, you're talking about four million bytes versus uh, versus twenty million or, yeah twenty million bytes. So it's you know 
the, the trade-off you're forced to make is, is just, it's kind of stark when you look at it. And then here's fast tuple, uh, which is really cool. So essentially, um, we're going to you know, allocate an array of fast tuples uh, on heap just to make sure it's a fair comparison. Um, and uh, we'll also so that memory, memory measure can measure how much it takes. And then this is a list of a lists, right? So if you, so if you for instance, if you use, um, if you use storm, uh, all your tuples in storm are actually like, a, like an array list underneath the covers. And so this, you know, if you were pushing, you know, millions of integers per second through storm, this is the kind of, uh, it's kind of overhead you'd be looking at, right? So let's run this guy. And it's going to take a while. There we go. Yeah, so 4x difference between, you know, the, uh, between the list of lists versus a bunch of fast tuples. So, you know, ta-da, the demos worked. Anyway, uh, so that's memory. Um, so the moral, moral of that story is use primitives and um, you'll be happy and everything will be nice. Actors, threading. Uh, whoop, that went the wrong way. There we go. So, um, you know, I wrote a blog post not too long ago that insulted a lot of people. Um, you know, mainly people who, you know, maintain actor frameworks. I, I've never, so I've tried to use a lot of stuff. I've even written my own um, that I don't recommend you use. Uh, most of my open source is just me trolling myself in the future. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I've, but I've never used an actor framework that, you know, really felt good, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm coming at it from the perspective of being a long-time Erlang programmer, and I love doing actors in Erlang, and it's never, it's never, you know, first of all, the, the experience, you know, the user experience of actually writing actor code on the JVM it has never felt right. It's never, it's never been the magic of Erlang, honestly, um, because you can, it's so easy to do all this ooky stuff and, and, and to screw it up pretty badly. Um, and you know it's it's just not the right platform for it. I don't think um, the the Java really was written to meant to, to do one to one with native threads. Um, and I I I'm asserting right here this is my opinion, but uh, you know the, the the best way to distribute work, um, to, to, you know, to, to do concurrent work is just a thread pull executor consuming events from a disruptor or a queue. Sorry, you can't have a pony. Um, you know, because you don't have because you don't have guarantees around shared memory. You don't have uh, you know you don't have a garbage collector per process. You don't have multitasking of the green threads either. Um, so you know that's a thing. And and even the um, and so you, you might say, oh, Killam has a bytecode weaver. Lots of things have bytecode weavers. The problem with the bytecode weavers is is that they screw up uh, they screw up Hotspot's ability to do inlining um, because they they bloat out the method sizes in the bytecode. Um, so anyway, I think the I think the, the moral of the story with threading is that um, you know obviously you could do a whole talk on doing proper threading in, in Java, but essentially like the 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 CETA stuff is kind of just the way things work on on Java, right? So you parallelize work on on the natural units of work. Um, you have events coming in through a queue or a disruptor or whatever, uh, and then essentially you just try to try to spin up the cores to do as much work as possible. Um, that that's it, and you have to tune if you, and you have to tune things yourself. Um, so everyone has that one, you know, thread pull executor that has a magic number of threads, and no one really knows why it why it's the value it is. It's like 40 threads that seems it works, you know. Um, so so obviously performance tuning and benchmarking uh, is huge, right? Like you have to do it because there is no no one no one to my knowledge has has implemented a, a thread pull executor that that can auto scale, and if you're gonna and, and fork join pull is definitely not the answer. Um, <laughs> Has anyone read the, the Java docs to phaser? The, the, the locking? Yeah. <sighs> Does anyone understand them? Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> Me neither. Um, yeah, micro benchmarks. Um, so micro benchmarking is, is uh, it's really cool. It's, it's how I did the benchmarks for fast tuple. Um, and you know, the, be the benchmark code is up on, is up on GitHub as well. Um, but micro benchmarks in Java, there's actually, there's finally a really good framework for doing it. And uh, micro benchmarking is a very powerful way of asserting uh, that, that, you know, the, 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 the JIT is doing what you think it's doing. Um, because, um, because of the, the warm up period, right? So the, uh, 
So, so you, can, you can optimize certain patterns. You can optimize little tiny pieces of code uh, to, to be able to, to build a better mental model of what the JVM is doing under the surface. Uh, so I think it's a really powerful tool when used in moderation. Um, and JMH is the, is the tool to do it. JMH is awesome. Uh, so it's maintained by the, the Java Performance Group. So um, there's, uh, there's one guy, uh, Alex Shipliv. Uh, he, he does a lot of work on it. He's, he's cool to follow on Twitter because it's like, Goes back and forth between like English and Russian, and you know it's, it's cool. Um, the the uh, so it's annotation based. Uh, it's 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 neat. What it does is it's a uh, it's a post processor. So you write out your code, you write out your benchmarking code, you put annotations in, uh, and then it runs as part of your Maven as part of your Maven build. Builds out, does a bunch of weird bytecode stuff, and builds out this 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 cool little uh, benchmark jar. Uh, and, and you can, it's a, so it's an executable jar. It has a bunch of command line options, and then you can you can tune it, right? So you can you can um, you can give it the number of threads to get to, to to use. You can give it the warm up periods. Um, there's all sorts of, of interesting options that you can use to to tune it and to to, to basically try to try to get try to get at what you're you know what, what you're looking for. And the the reporting is all standard, so you can share your results with other people, and it's great. Uh, and I mean, that's that's what it looks like too. Like it's really, really simple. See, one of the one of the one of the great things about uh, about about JMH is that it, it provides automatic black holing. Uh, so a cool thing. So so the so the back up a bit. So the hotspot. So, so hotspot is is smart enough to understand when you have dead code. So like when a result of when the result of a computation isn't used anywhere, it will automatically take that piece of code and say, yeah, you know what, you don't need to execute because no one uses your result. Um, so most benchmarks uh, actually fall technically fall under the category of dead code because they're just doing stuff for the for its own sake. Um, so what uh, JMH does is if you inside of your benchmark method, if you return the result of your computation, um, it will automatically it'll it'll it does what it, what it calls black black holing the the result. And I don't know what actually happens there, but supposedly it it it, it makes it so that the so that hotspot doesn't automatically mark this as dead code. Uh, it's really cool. So it keeps your benchmarks at least somewhat honest. <sighs> and that takes us to, to working with the JIT. Um, so this is really um, where you can get into some, some interesting stuff. Um, so I, what, I, what I like to do is I, I, I like to sort of structure and design my code for, for how the JIT is going to, or at least my, the mental model I've built up of what the JIT's going to do. Um, so a lot of this is writing short methods. Um, so there's actually, so there's a JVM, there's a, Tuning parameter on the command line that you can set the uh, you can set the max so you can set the the, the maximum size of method uh, for inlining because what ha what happens is, is that if it's beyond like 36 bytes I think something like that so if the if the uh, if the byte code is beyond a certain size uh, that method will no longer be a candidate for inlining um, so yeah. it's 325 if it's a hot method thank you thank you so he said it's 325 if it's a hot method so um, by default so. Um, you, you can tune that. Uh, you can tune that in the command line, see if it makes a difference. But what you sh really should do is write shorter methods. Um, you need to uh, what else? Yeah, because because actually the the funny thing is most of the performance gains, <coughs> excuse me, most of the performance gains you get from uh, from the JIT actually all come from inlining. <laughs> Uh, it's 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 like the eighty percent rule, right? So most of it comes from inlining. Um, and you just kind of structure things to uh, to take advantage of the inlining. So, um, like like polymorphic dispatch from the same call site. So, what, what do I mean by that? So, you know, you have your your object hierarchy, right? So, you have two objects, uh, you know, two two classes. They um, you know they both inherit from the same thing, and they have a you know an abstract virtual method, right? So, if they have that abstract virtual method, you know, if if you're in C plus plus, you'd 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 always have to use the the the, the method table, but in what 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 the JIT does in Java is it looks at that, and as long as the call site is monomorphic, in other words, as long as that call site always goes to one class, the JIT will see that and it'll say, "Oh, okay, cool. You're never going to go to the other thing, so I'm just going to inline." So, so this is now a candidate for inlining. So it can even inline like an invoke virtual as long as the call site's monomorphic. Um, but if you have a polymorphic call site, in other words, if you have you know, let's say you're looping over. Uh, let's say you're looping over an array or looping over a list, um, and then you have 
one, you know, one side of the hierarchy in, is, is in the list, the other side of the hierarchy is also in the list, they're all mixed up and heterogeneous. You know, they both inherit from the same thing. Um, that means that that call, that call site is, is now polymorphic, and so that, that, that call site is not going to be able, is not gonna, ha is not gonna have the same opportunity for optimization. Um, so what, what's gonna happen there is it'll always go through the, v, it'll always go through the V table, and you, you, can't, uh, you can't get around it. Um, so yeah, don't do that. <clears throat> Keep uh, small objects local. So, uh, so Java has this thing called escape analysis. So I, it, it's kind of a lie when, when they say that objects always go on the heap. They don't always go on the heap. Sometimes, you know, I need to catch this in the wild one of these days, but sometimes, supposedly, uh, it, will, it, will, um, it will allocate them on the stack. Um, I mean, you don't know it's on the stack, but supposedly sometimes it'll allocate them on the stack as long as, as, long as the escape analysis says that the, uh, that the object does not escape from that scope. Um, I'm not sure whether that's true or not, but all the docs seem to suggest it, so. <laughs> like I said, you gotta catch it in the wild to make sure it actually exists. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, so there's, uh, and then using intrinsic methods is really cool. So there's, the, so there's certain methods in the standard library that are actually, it's sort of like, uh, they, they kind of just punch out and uh, go directly to assembly. Um, so, there's, uh, so there's stuff in uh, uh, Java Lang Math. So pretty much all the calls in Java Lang Math are actually implemented natively. Uh, System.array copy is, imp is, is implemented nat natively. And, and I, I don't mean, and wh when I say natively, I don't mean J and I. So you're not paying the J and I costs except with the allocate memory for I don't know why. Um, but for most of these, it's actually, it's, it's, a literal it's a literal replacement of that code with, with, with uh, an assembly macro. Um, so you, you don't have to pay the penalties and it ends up being extremely fast. It's really cool. Um, and you can, you, can, you can find where, the, where they are. Um, so, if you go to, so if you search for the OpenJDK, uh, the, the OpenJDK um, source control, uh, library call.cpp has, has all the, has a big list of all the, um, of all the intrinsics, yeah. So if you really want to know what the JIT's doing and how you, you know, catch these things in the wild and actually uh, find it, um, is, is uh, by, by, by doing the print inlining and doing the print assembly. Um, and then using those with, with, J, with, using those with JMH to make sure that you, the method you're calling gets hot, right? Um, and so this is, uh, this is what an assembly dump looks like. This is a, a, an assembly dump from, uh, from FastTuple. And uh, from, this, from its from its um, uh, from its uh, benchmarking suite. So the cool thing is, is that inside of the assembly dump, you you get um, you know it it it'll, it'll annotates things with the with uh, with the source code, right? Which is really which is really nice. So even if you don't know assembly that well, um, you can still kind of follow along and say, oh, okay, you know, I know all these things are related to a new. I know all these things are related to this method. And so you can sort of like paw your way through it and, and you know, maybe learn a little assembly along the way to see what's happening. Um, but essentially, you know, if, a lot, if, if an instruction results in a lot of assembly, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, yeah. So, so these are the, 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 some of the stuff that I mentioned in the talk. Uh, the mechanical sympathy list is really good for like if you have questions, because like all the people who do this stuff all the time for a living are on there, and they're, they're actually really nice, and, and they don't yell at you for being an idiot. Um, there's uh, JMH. Um, the Hotspot Wiki has a lot of that sort of folklore stuff, um, but it's, it's, it's really good like, you know, to, to, as a starting point for finding these weird optimizations. Like, like I got a buddy of mine found, uh, yeah, actually, actually, he, he <clears throat> was it. He found uh, like vector vectorization was happening in, in certain cases with with Java Seven, and it's like you know he went on a hunt to try and find it. And yeah, it's, anyway, the, the the JIT does all sorts of weird stuff, so it's it's cool. Um, and yeah, HPPC. That's uh, uh, you know the perform the high performance collections and fast tuple, etc. So, anyways, questions. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, so what he said was is that <clears throat> it, with the polymorphic dispatch, 
It turns out dimorphic. So, to, so if you're calling out the two things, it's it's gonna it, the, it, it can actually inline. Um, if you're calling out the three, though, then you're hosed. So, awesome. How did you measure how many bytes a, a, a data structure took in Java? Oh, uh, so that was uh, so that's a library called. Uh, um, let me let me bring it up for you because that's a that's a great um, that's a great uh, uh, question. Um, where is it? Uh, crap. Oh, it's, it's not it's not in here. Okay, um, so that is a uh, hang on. No, 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 no. So that's uh, so it's something object explorer dot memory measure. So what it is, it's uh, let me let me bring up the. Uh, this is really hard to do on a. Uh, wait, where is my? Uh, oh, run. There we go. Hang on. This is like really hard to do looking at this askew. Uh, run configuration. Bring out the. No, I want the fucking run configuration. Oh, here we go. Edit configurations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So it uses a Java agent. Uh, so it uses this this agent path in the agent API uh, and allows you to. Uh, it's called the, it's called Object Explorer. So you just load this jar as a, uh, So you load that jar using the Java agent um, uh, command line, and it, it it gives you the API that you can use to actually measure the allocations. Um, and it walks the object tree, and it's actually true byte measurement. So it's not like estimating anything. Uh, and it can do that because it has because it's using the agent API, so it's really cool. Um, yeah, Object Explorer. Sorry, I didn't put that in the resources, but that's that was a good question. So uh, how does fast Google does it have anything for strings or variable length objects? <laughs> so the question is, does fast tuple have anything for strings or variable length objects? No. <laughs> uh, I mean, I can imagine I, it's not a use case I have. Um, if somebody asked for it, we could figure out how to do it. Um, but it's, you know, I, I avoided it on purpose. <laughs> I wanted to make it easier for myself. So I have a follow-up question. Yeah. Um, so I don't see string encoding in any of the knowledge you're dropping. You just not do a lot of... Oh, that's a good, oh, yeah, 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 that's a good question. Yeah, I totally glossed over the string. Yeah, so the question was, uh, he didn't see anything about string encoding, and that, that's a great question. That, that um, yeah, string encoding screws you pretty badly. Um, so there's... Uh, yeah, so there's like big locks inside. So if you're so if you're doing string encoding and you're looking it up using like the, the actual UTF-8. Uh, so if you say UTF-8 in a string, um, wh when you're doing like the get bytes or whatever, it w what'll happen is it will um, it goes out to this like hash map off in the distance and uh, there's a lock around it. So if you're doing this, so if you're doing this like like let's say you're you're writing up you know a high concurrency server that pulls in a lot of strings from the internet. Uh, what's going to happen is every time you do that encoding, if you if you call if you call out wrong, every time you do the encoding, it's going to uh, it's going to hit contention on that that weird hidden uh, hash map there. Yeah, encoding ends up being uh, awful. So when uh, the, the so the actor library that I uh, so the actor library that I um, th um, well, I'm not going to try to navigate up here, but so the actor the actor library uh, that, that I wrote called Scaling um, it's it's terrible except for the string encoder. Uh, so the string encoder uses uh, uh, uses unsafe to actually map the bytes straight straight on. So it's just going to assume that you're uh, you know that that you're just just you know, you're not doing anything fancy, right? But it's uh, essentially it, it maps the bytes directly onto uh, directly onto the byte array of the uh, of, of the string object, and it doesn't go through any of the encoding bullshit. So it's like super fast. It's good. But then you don't have a UTF-16 string, right? Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's it's. Yeah, I mean it's super it's super janky, right? Like if, if you're trying to do if you're trying to do things like other languages are actually doing coding, it's a bad idea, right? But if I'm if I'm if I just want ASCII stuff off of the off of the uh, off the wire, and, and I know it's going to be that, like I why why go through the pain? So, but yes, you're correct. It's janky as hell. <laughs> yep, sir. So yeah, yeah, exactly. It just yeah, it just doesn't do any of the checking that, that normally happens in the encoding process. So. Yeah, Kyle. So, sorry, uh, JDP said it's a cache for that uh, string encoder, which is also monomorphic, and we busted it into string encoding. So, using the literal string UTF-8 stuff is faster than using the string encoder to deal with the cache map. Right. Yeah. So, so Kyle saying using using string UTF-8 is 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 fast is sometimes faster than than going. To, I'm sorry, I just totally butchered that up. Uh, yeah. Anyway. 
Yeah, it is. It's pretty pretty horrifying. Well, I mean, the, well, if, if you're a Scala fan, you know, uh, symbols in Scala have a similar like interning nightmare inside of them. Uh, so if you're trying to intern new symbols, so like like let's let's say because you wanted to get fancy, you know, you're pulling things off the wire, you're dynamically interning symbols. Um, that that goes to a big map hidden behind the standard library that has a lock around it. For the um, love of God, don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> correct, correct. Don't do that. Um, but I've been dumb enough to do that in the past, so that's why I know. <laughs> Go back to Ruby. <laughs> Damn. Wow. Hecklers. All right. Yep. All right. I got to wrap it up, but uh, thanks, everybody. <laughs>